This time on Hack5, open source pen testing tools in academia with InfoSec. All that and more this time on Hack5. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Hack5. My name is Shannon Morse. I'm Darren Kitchen. And this is your weekly dose of Technolust. You They're always walk in. Fake out. You like, always I feel walk like, in. You're I feel so like mean. I should walk in. I should throw my sweater on a chair, and then I should tie my shoes. Oh my gosh! Like, uh, what was his name? Oh, I used to watch that show when I was a kid. What was it called? The the one with the Mr. dude Rogers. in the sweater. Yes, Mr. Rogers. Yes. <laughs> I knew I could. I could. We need a, We need a new mind. set. We need like a big living room set to be able to do that. that. Would It'd be, be fantastic. That would be really cool. Bring back the swivel camera. Oh man. The crane. We need to. That yeah, would be yeah. Really neat. We could. We could use a little. A little sprucing up in the studio. Yeah, I think anyway, so, we got some fun stuff today. We do. We have a couple of different interviews. The first one with is with Chris, aka Lava Lamp, on Twitter. Uh, he is talking about open sourcing his tool, which helps you automate a lot of penetration testing and a lot of like vulnerability like scanning, enumeration, getting really an idea cool. of the assets of the organization. Yeah, cool stuff. Even if you're not doing a pen test, if right. you're like an IT administrator. You might want to use this against your own stuff. And then right after that, we are interviewing Brittany, who is in academia, and she's talking about how you can further project research even after people graduate so that InfoSec uh, professionals can also use these tools as well. So really interesting stuff today. I hope you enjoy it. We got good stuff from DEF CON. We'll see you on the other side. Today, we have the unique pleasure of being joined by Chris Grayson from Website. Chris, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, uh, dude, so much awesome stuff came out of DEF CON this year. You had an awesome yeah. talk and you also tweeted, quote, yes, I'm open sourcing a software platform that automates attack surface enumeration. Uh, we chatted about it briefly with Mel over by the lock picking station. Uh, tell me about the technology of Lava Lamp and, and what brought it on and, and how you came to now release it to the open source community. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So my background is in like network penetration testing. I really like breaking into things. Um, and I kind of found throughout throughout the course of getting better at that, that I was doing a lot of manual information gathering, like running NMAP scans, taking that, throwing it over to eyewitness, uh, using Metasploit to gather information about SMB servers, all this stuff. Uh, and, and I found that it wasn't really whether or not uh, Basically, if you just looked harder, all you have to do is find the stuff that everybody else had missed. Uh, and so I got pretty good at that, and like kind of, I spent pretty much half the time of all these engagements gathering all that information, uh, and that's what enabled me to be very successful. Uh, so what website is is just that automated at scale. So it runs network scans, it does domain name record lookups, it uh, does subdomain enumeration. Um, it does application layer fingerprinting, uh, it takes screenshots of web applications, uh, it crawls web applications, it tries to identify the frameworks with them, it exposes it all via an API, it's consumed on the front end by a front uh, single page app written in Angular. Um, but really the goal here is to make it so that you can have the situational awareness that you require to either defend the organization that you're uh, responsible for or to attack it. Um, yeah, wow, so, that, that's yeah. that's a whole lot, and I know that there's been several tools. I mean, you know, you can do this manually. There's a, yes. a ton of tools out there. What were some of the tools that you were using to do this previously? So running Nmap using Zmap, uh, I really like Chris Trunker's Eyewitness. You basically just feed it a list of URLs, and it spits back to you a report with a bunch of screenshots. Because like honestly, you know, this is 2017. The majority of your attack surface is probably in your web applications. And if I have a list of 5,000 URLs, there's really not a good process for me to, to determine what's on those endpoints other than give me some screenshots about them. Um, so it uses Phantom JS. Uh, it also uses like Python Celery. Um, it, outside of that, there's also another tool called Scanneral, which is some new, uh, uh, like basically network service fingerprinting tool written in Erlang. So I'm probably going to roll that in as well. Um, but that's really kind of, and Metasploit as well, of course, uh, for all kind of the information <laughs> gathering modules they have. Right. Now, you know, here's the thing. Uh, your, your tool focuses heavily on automation, which actually a lot of other tools focus on. You mentioned Nmap, Metasploit, and things of that nature. I feel like as hackers, we're very keen on automating those mundane tasks, whether that's yeah. born out of laziness or boredom or just you know wanting to make time for the more important things in life, like Counter-Strike. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Why do you think that is? So, I mean, uh, I've heard before that uh, the best programmers are the laziest ones uh, because you write something right once uh, and then it just does it right and you have that free time again. Um, but when, when it comes to automation, as, as far as this project was concerned, uh, by the time that I was continuing to get better at, at network pen testing, I found myself more responsible for helping these organizations secure their perimeters. So um, instead of like, I'm only attacking, now I'm kind of going onto the blue side. 
And uh, really, these companies did not have situational awareness. It's like every single time I got in, they, you know, I would show them how I got in. Like, oh, what, where is that? How did you find that? Uh, and so automation in this sense, like you need to have situational awareness about your environment, about your network, about your enterprise. And if you're only using manual tools to gather all this information, by the time you put it all together, you collate it, you create some sort of cohesive understanding of the environment, half of that data is probably stale. I mean, if you think about how quickly an enterprise network changes, like if you looked at what's on an enterprise network at 8 a.m., at 4 p.m., and then at 10 p.m. in a single day, it can be completely different. So if you don't have something that has the ability to automate that information gathering process, then the fact that you run it manually, it's too slow. By the time that you actually have any understanding of what you're looking at, you probably uh, are looking at a significant amount of stale data. So that was one of the big motivations for me. Cool, cool. Now I want to come back to automation in a second, but I also feel like as hackers, we're also compelled to not only understand complex system, which your tool seems to do pretty well, but also to create our own. And I feel like a business is really no different. So what were your key takeaways from this experience uh, building out this tool as a business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, I've actually, I have it on my to-do list to write a postmortem of kind of the things that went wrong. Um, but so one thing is, if you're going to try and start a company, have a partner. Uh, like I tried this, do it, doing this as a one-man show. You will get, you will read a lot of things that say run and as lean as mean as you possibly can. And I did that, and then I found out that I was running too lean. Uh, there were too many things. I could handle it in the beginning, but then as things kind of uh, ramped up, there was there were more things that I had to take responsibility for. So reaching out to customers, uh, doing marketing, building the website. Uh, building the front end, user experience, user interface, uh, when you know this was all detracting from my ability to continue building out the product. Uh, so that was one really big takeaway. Uh, another really big takeaway uh, is that you need to have a product that actually, uh, basically going to somebody and telling them that their house is on fire, uh, when they're very much aware of that, is not very helpful. So I would go to people and I would say, look, I'm gonna give you the situational awareness that you need in order to strategize properly upon how you can actually defend this network. And they're like, we already know that everything is bad. Like we are already so inundated. We have too many problems. We don't have enough headcount. We don't have enough staff. What they need is water. So a lot of the feedback that I got was like, okay, this tool is great, but how does it start detracting from my problems? It's going to tell me more. It might enable me to prioritize better, but what they wanted was, is this going to instrument my um, vulnerability scanners? Is it going to make them more effective? Uh, is it going to automatically get rid of some of these issues so that I don't have to worry about them anymore? Um, and that really wasn't within the scope of the tool that I was building. Um, so those two put together uh, were kind of two of the biggest takeaways for what I would do differently or what I will do differently the next time. Mm, no, no, I feel you. I mean, and it's, you know, it's, it's so much easier to identify what's wrong than it is to go and fix it. Kind of like it's easier to break yeah. something than it is to build something. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I feel like as, you know, similar to brilliant artists, right? I feel like brilliant hackers may be something that you're just born with. Well, being at least good at business is a skill you could just learn. You mentioned yeah. a very important skill, delegation very important one to learn that <laughs> yes, I'm still yeah. struggling with. Um, Absolutely. What skills would you have learned that might have helped you get the company off the ground better outside of just having partners and, and people to delegate to? Delegation for sure. Uh, time management for sure as well. I think especially when you're an engineer, um, when you start dealing with stuff that's kind of outside of the technical realm, it's very stressful. And, and it's kind of my way of handling that was like, okay, well, I'll deal with this for a bit, but I'm going to go back to writing software because I know how to do that. So I'm going to keep building this product out because if the product's good enough, people will buy it. Uh, but that wasn't really, that wasn't really the case. Uh, I, I should have, it should have been incremental improvements instead of focusing on, I'm going to make this as good as possible, make it as big as possible before, before I try to bring it to market. In retrospect, I should have focused on getting something small out the door that people would have put money in my hands for and then iterated upon that. Uh, and so instead of doing that, I, I went too far as a, as a solo founder and, and, you know, kind of found myself in, in troubled waters. Hmm. Well, I mean, so you did build out quite a large system. So let's go back to talking about some of the technology. Uh, sure. Since you're now releasing, you know, the intellectual property of what, two years of your work? Two years, yeah. So how can I, as a hacker, go and use this today? What, what am I going to need to know uh, to, to spin something up? Is, have you made it easy or yeah. is there like a, a path I can take? 
It's uh, so it's quite complex. It's very dependency laden. Uh, on my GitHub page, there are three separate repositories. There's one for the front end code, which is all written in uh, Angular two TypeScript. There's one for the back end code, which is all Python. So it uses makes use of Django REST framework, uh, Python Celery. It relies upon RabbitMQ. It relies on Elasticsearch, Post, Postgres, Redis. Uh, so it's very complex to get it all up. And so the third repository is I've actually Dockerized everything. Um, so I would highly recommend that anybody that wants to play around with this, uh, check out the Docker repository. All you have to do is basically set up your own Elasticsearch server and set up your own Postgres server, and then copy some config files over, fill the config files out, and then just build the Docker images and then Docker compose up and you'll have it running locally. Um, so it's in that sense, it's fairly easy to get set up. But then if you're going to run this in production, I would recommend getting the two separate repositories and getting it set up at scale. Wow, see that actually leads beautifully into my next question and it kind of, you know, hits on that point of like we're all into automation and convenience, right? Yeah. Uh, even as hackers. And so and the Docker image, yeah, it does sound like a great way to just like get up to speed, uh, but of course in production you want to go through your own fun dependency hell. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing, the, the byproduct of automation, of, of unique skills, this unique skill of being able to understand the attack surface and identify those vulnerabilities, that, that being automated you know, makes that tool something that anyone can become a better hacker by having, but some may argue that this may foster a community of script kiddies where just anyone can point a tool at something and do something that had previously taken a human with a lot of skill. What are your thoughts on that? So, so I want to distinguish that I'm actually not looking for vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, anybody that's seen a Nessus report uh, or, well, any, any vulnerability scanner report knows that there's usually a lot of noise. Uh, you know, these can be hundreds of pages long. Uh, it's not usually all that helpful. What I found was that I didn't really need vulnerability scanners to tell me anything. What I wanted to know about are what web apps are you running? What versions are they running? Uh, what different network services that you, do you have open? What different SSL protocols do you support? Uh, so I'm not actually collecting any information about vulnerabilities. I'm only collecting information about the environment so that you can then strategize on top of that. And as far as the whole script kitty thing goes, um, you know, the more we automate anything, the more we make anything easier. Of course, there will be you know bad actors that get their hands on it. But the goal of this tool is to provide you with kind of the I liken it to so if you like Game of Thrones, you know, you see all these people strategizing for the battle the next day and they're all standing around a, uh, a table, and on that table is a map. And right now, I feel like we don't really have that map to strategize for the battle that we're all currently waging. And so I want to provide that map. If you aren't skilled and somebody gives you a map, then you're not really going to know what to do with it. But if you do have that information in hand and you have the skills as well, having that situational awareness is going to enable you to be far more effective. Wow, yeah, no, it, it does definitely seem like one of those things where, uh, you know, especially with the screenshots, being able to see like what do those 5,000 yep. websites actually look like, yep. feeding that information into a skilled professional that can at a glance know like, oh, that, that's where the good stuff lies, you still do need, so maybe your target market was actually red teams uh, and, and not companies. Yeah. It, it was it was both. That was another. So so going back to your question earlier uh, about you know how would you improve upon this? Uh, knowing your target market, I thought I was going to enterprises. I kind of wanted to blow this up big. Uh, but the people that were most interested in it were consultancies because they saw you know they're doing all this internally. Like a lot of teams have actually tried building tools like this internally. They rely upon this information. So uh, yeah, it's. I had built it originally as a red team tool, but then when I heard from some blue teamers, they're like, oh yeah, if you can just tell me, literally if you can just tell me where all of my WordPress apps are, that's a huge benefit. <laughs> so I started catering towards uh, towards, towards yeah. them as well. Yeah, do you know where that NT4 server is in the closet? Yeah, exactly. Like we're seeing packets from it, but we literally have no clue in the data center where it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so we're just going to black hole that network traffic, uh, and, so, and we're just going to call it a day, yeah. Yeah, nice, nice, yeah. yeah. And then the ethernet cable ran into the wall. <laughs> Sorry, detracting into ghost stories. Listen, where can people find more about uh, about uh, website and and how can they contribute to the project going forward? Oh man, so uh, my check out my GitHub repo. So my username on uh, GitHub is Lava Lamp with a dash after it. Uh, it turns out that when your handle is Lava Lamp, you can't get that name on freaking any social media site because they're all taken up by the company. Uh, you know, but. Whatever. So they can go there, they can contribute to those repositories. I wrote a blog post on this as well, explaining kind of my motivations behind it and how to use it and how to get it set up. Uh, all, the, all the code repositories are heavily documented. Um, and I've actually already gotten some issues from people that are trying to set it up. And so I'm very much, you know, this is kind of a labor of love. 
I'm still very much involved in this. You know, at my current position, I get to continue contributing to it. Uh, so yeah, check out the GitHub repos, check out the documentation. If, you know, if there's any questions, anything like that, I try to respond as quickly as possible. Check out my blog, which is uh, l.avala.mp. Uh, I was pretty happy to get that one uh, for a post on it. Um, and yeah, just go from there. Uh, Chris, dude, thank you so much for joining us. I really can't wait to check out your postmortem on your blog as well. And, and just thank you for taking your labor of love and that two years of intellectual property and pouring it out into the uh, open source community. I just know that when you put good into the universe, good comes back. And I wish you all the best. Hey, thank you so much. And like, really, you know, I can't stress enough that especially in this industry, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Like, we could not do, I mean, there's so much good open source software in this community. It's the, you know, by the time that everything had failed, I had no qualms releasing it because, you know, I'm here because of what people have done before me. So I'd love to put it forward. And thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you. I really, I, I applaud your efforts and I applaud everything you're doing for this community. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Got a great idea? Bring it to the web the way we do and head over to Domain.com. They've got a slick domain discovery system and an easy checkout process so your site will be online in no time. And the Domain.com guys have been supporting Hack5 for years and they want to celebrate with a massive promo code. Use HAK Jumbo for 35% off new domain registrations now through November 30th. It's a limited time offer, so when you think domain names, think Domain.com. Lately, I've been really digging into the humanist approach to InfoSec, and one of the people that's really delving into this as well for academia is Brittany Posnikoff, aka Straith, over on Twitter. So you can always find her over there. She is over at University of Waterloo working in the Cryptography and Security and Privacy Lab. Brittany, how are you doing today? Very well, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome, thank you. So I really wanted to delve into this because uh, I think this is sorely missing from the infosec industry as far as how do you take these projects that a lot of people are working on in academia and you actually turn it into something that you know companies and in infosec uh, uh, culture can actually use. So the big thing that uh, I sort of talk about is how researchers, when they're building these tools, the tools aren't their focus. Tools mm -hmm. aren't science. Tools help you do science. Right. And so by the, pe by the time uh, you have a master's student or a PhD student that's been working on this tool for two, five, two to five years uh, to support their science, they're ready to drop it by the time they're done. Like, honestly, <laughs> that's a long time to be working on one thing that isn't even your major focus. It helps you to meet your focus. So by the time they're done, they just kind of want to drop it in most cases. Um, and while you're doing your master's and PhD, usually you can't let people help you on those tools because it's something you have to do yourself. Right. Uh, depending on the setup, whether you're using it for your thesis itself, then yeah, you can have that help. So the big thing that I really try and promote is joining up uh, industry and academia and making sure that partnership's there. So as soon as the research is done, they have somebody to pass it off on to. Because mm. um, at that point, you know, the person might be going on to a PhD and a new topic if they're a master's student, or they may be going to industry or they may be going for that job. So they're really just done. Um, and the other thing I really try and show is like, <sighs> Usually these tools aren't made for for anybody else to see. It is, what can I program super fast to make sure this tool is done, I can finish my thesis, I can move on with my life. <laughs> right, so sometimes it's kind of broken or like it just does the thing and there's no notes in the code. But I'm sure that industry professionals would also be able to get some use out of these tools as well, right? Very true. But the big barrier here is that people are really embarrassed by their code sometimes. And it's really hard to put it public and put that time into cleaning it up when you're just so done with it. Mm. So, the, so the big thing uh, people in industry, when they want to offer to take over a tool, is to suggest like, hey, I will do a code review. I will clean it up for you. I will make sure it's presentable and get your OK with it before I post it on GitHub and give you credit. So what do academia uh, experts and people that are creating these tools for, you know, their, for their final exams or whatever it might be, what do they need to do to really um, get these tools out into the industry so that everybody can make use of them? It really just is that partnership. Um, you know, having somebody in industry who's read your paper and if they're super excited, excited about it and want it, just to email the um, academic person and say, hey, can I can I help put this tool on the market? How can I get this out there open right. source? 
And then it is just, yeah, offering to do that code review, offering to get the code off to snuff so these people aren't embarrassed and they don't think that, you know, like bad code can can make it more difficult to get a job if that's <laughs> your big thing, right? Oh, so yeah, totally. Offering to help these people out is huge. So, of course, us InfoSec professionals who are out of school right now, we need to focus a lot more on taking people under our wing, networking with them. Uh, from the academia side, are there things that they could do better as well to make sure that their tools are being used? Um, so we love it in academia when industry people have open source tools. Like, right. oh my gosh, it makes <laughs> everything so much easier um, when there's a tool that will like generate fake traffic for you, or when it will, or if there's tools that will let you do that one specific thing. And like the big thing with academia is, as soon as industry like gets that tool out there, makes it obvious that it's out there, and one person adopts it in a paper, you see that tool proliferate so fast throughout academia. Like everybody's using it the next year. So we're huge proponents of like getting uh, that open source software for sure. Now you mentioned papers, and this is something that I also wanted to ask you about. A lot of times when I do research for my own shows, I run into paywalls online. I can't find the direct research that I need, although I can find plenty of articles about those things. But I prefer to go straight to the source to find out the information that I need so that I can make sure that it's extremely factual. Is there anything that I could do from my end to make sure that I'm getting their information out there like straight from the facts as opposed to running into these paywalls? Sure. So the thing is, is as academics, our whole life is set, centered around citations. Like right. the more people you can get using your, your information, the better. Like it just helps our career too. So the thing is, is like paywalls kind of hurt us too. Yeah. Um, so the big thing there is honestly, just approach the academic who's written the paper. Like if you do a Google scholarship search, and find the paper you want and you see the list of authors, check their webpage. Most academics will be posting their work on their webpage. Um, like PDF copies, you can just grab it there. Um, the other big thing is just asking them directly because if there's a chance you could help them out by inviting them to come do a talk or inviting them to uh, help with an article or something else, that they can also put that on their CV, which is really supporting too. So it's just approach people, talk to them. This is a community. We like helping each other out. Send so them just, 140 characters on Twitter. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, that's worked before. Uh, <laughs> so it's just, yeah, approach them at least to say, hey, this is the thing I'm working on. This is why I really like your paper. I will give you a shout out. I will, you know, give you some way to reference this in your own CV. Um, please help me out. And I mean, honestly, we love spreading our information too. We're out there to help <laughs> each other. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love it when I hear that other people are trying to get things open source, trying to kind of include everybody in their research as well. I, I think that's so important, especially in InfoSec because it's grown continuously. Um, I did want to make a slight tangent. I know that conventions are a great place for people to network, especially not just to find jobs, but also to share the research that they're doing in talks, like the talk that you gave at B-Sides, but also uh, just to talk to people on the show floor. Do you recommend going to conventions as a good way as well? Definitely. I actually brought my own first year this year, and um, she actually did full stack development in, and I always talked about how much I loved InfoSec and how great the community was for supporting me and making me um, just grow faster. And she came and it blew her away how supportive everybody was, That's awesome. how much people were willing to talk to her. And I would definitely suggest it just because it is that opportunity to meet people, get out there, share your research and just like geek out with a bunch of other people. Totally. <laughs> I completely agree with you. I'm on this like convention high right now just because of the amazing week that we just spent in Las Vegas. And I'm so happy I got to meet you as well. Is there anything that we did not include in this interview yet that you would also like to include? The other thing I'm really trying to support out there is the idea that if you're in, this, in industry and want to write a paper, approach an academic. We are mm -hmm. like willing to collaborate, help you write that paper and get your work basically immortalized. That paper stays there forever. So if you ever need any help writing a paper, reach out to your like friendly academics. Yes. Find some mentors in the industry. Brittany, where can people reach out to you if they have any questions or if they are looking for somebody that uh, can help them with their papers? 
Um, as you said earlier, they can definitely approach me. And I'm on Twitter with Straith, S-T-R-A-I-T-H-E. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brittany. It was a pleasure speaking to you and good luck in your career. Well, that just about wraps up this week's episode of Pack 5. But before we get going, I want to thank everyone for what is that? Sending stickers! us stickers. We so have stickers. stickers. We also have some gifts from a fan, but I'm going to leave those for the next coming weeks Sounds because good. we have several that I've been waiting for you to get back into studio I'm so back. that we could open them. Oh, we're going to have a mail time. It's going to be fun. We are going to have mail time. So if you want to send us stickers or gifts from fans, uh, you can send those over to hack5.org address. That is our current address that you can send products or um, stickers to. We love supporting mm. everybody in the mm. industry, so definitely let us know. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a bunch of new stickers, so let's do a little fast roll. Oh. Yes, Dude, stick what's up on the set. This, this might be my favorite. It says NSA monitored device. I got that from uh, Dong Life. Okay. You, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I kind of want to put it on my laptop here because it is an NSA monitored device. Oh, but nice. then again, what isn't? So let's just put it on the wall. <laughs> I want to give a quick shout out as well to this one, which is Armistice Brewing Company, which is a brand new local brewery in the East Bay in San Francisco, or San Francisco uh, East Bay area. So if you are in the Richmond, California area, check them out. They're brand new. They have really, really good beers and they brew them on site. So hey, very, very you know what? Guys. We should all get together at a brewery and launch a new Hack 5 product. That sounds like a really good idea. We should talk to them and see if we could do it there. I don't know. Maybe. Sweet. Hey, speaking of awesome Hack 5 gear, you can find it over at our very own Hack Shop, uh, including Get this, have you seen this? This was at DEF CON and now we've just launched it in the shop. It's I the new Hack 5 Field Kit. I am so stoked about this because it has the latest edition of the Field Kit book covering Yay. the Duck Eternal, the Pineapple, and the Turtle. Pineapple. Duck Turtle Pineapple Bunny. Bunny. See, I, <laughs> I know all of them. And anyway, I'm just like really stoked about this because it's like all the gear. It's cool. And all the gear. So yeah. you just, you can't go wrong. Um, thank you for supporting us over the years. HAKshop.com is where you can find all the Hack 5 gear. Yay! I think that's it. And hack5.org for all the things. All the shows. Check it out. We'll see you next week. Until then, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. Trust your techno lust. I gotta, you gotta get the look. I feel like I'm, am I like punching Nazis or something? You're punching. <laughs>